So hello and welcome back to AIB C Summit YouTube channel. We're here to bring you news on all things blockchain and crypto. And today we're discussing supply chains, the benefits they have for organizations and some huge developments that we've seen in the space. And joining me to discuss this, we have John Walpert, who's blockchain pioneer, known for his work in IBM blockchain consensus and baseline protocol. Dan Wakenberger from Morpheus Network and Noam as well. So great to have all three of you join me on the line today. Thank you, Jessica. Great to be here. Thank you for having me. Great to have you both. And, and I want to start with you, John, because what we've seen is some really interesting developments from Braceline Protocol recently. And the most interesting very recently is version 1.0. So congratulations. It sounds really exciting. And I'd love to hear from you, first of all, uh, what you've seen uh, in the announcements in the most recent weeks. Right. Well, it's great, great to be here. And yeah, Baseline-Protocol.org is where uh, folks can go to find out all about Baseline. Baseline, I, let me say what it's not, right? Baseline is not, it's it's a really good name. So it sounds like it's a product or a platform or something like uh, fabric or, or or what have you. It's not, it's a technique and it's a standard uh, that is in development under the Oasis uh, standards, open standards body, which is a venerable um, open standards organization has been around for decades behind SGML and SAML and MQTT and AMQP and all these internet-y sort of things. And um, so we're building this protocol so that you don't have any vendor lock-in when you use um, both pri private and public, but I I'll, I'll talk about my point of view, which is public blockchain, um, as a integration layer for different traditional systems of record, right? So a lot of things that talk about blockchain, they talk, and I've had a hand in this, um, having been part of starting IBM blockchain and Hyperledger and Hyperledger Fabric. Uh, we, in 2015, a lot of us in the enterprise thought of a blockchain as a safer magical database. And it turns out that's not a very good way to think about blockchains. They're not a good place to store confidential data. In fact, if you have anything that's sensitive at all under any circumstances, don't put it on a blockchain, put it on a database. Amazing technology we invented in the earlier, right? Um, they have good access controls. They have good security systems. They're, the, the blockchain pattern is, by definition, you have to really bend it into a pretzel, as we did with Fabric, to make it um, comp uh, allow you to compartmentalize information. Um, it's just not a good pattern for that. Any Anybody with a node, and if it's a public blockchain, anybody can have a node. That's the point of it. Makes it really tamper resistant, but it doesn't make it very good at surveillance resistance if that's what you're worried about. You don't want your data to be surveilled by other people. So it's funny, in, in the enterprise, we talk about, oh, let's use blockchain for transparency. The, and then I ask, do you really want that? Do you want your supply chain data in front of everybody in the world or any uh, competitors? No, you don't. You want it to be transparent with the companies that you want to be transparent with on a record by record basis. And if you do that, you can't use a blockchain for it. However, you can use the blockchain as a way to ensure and enforce that the d record in my database is identical verifiably to the record in your database. So this is a re kind of convergence of database technology with blockchain. And I, I think the maybe the punchline there is if you're if you try to if you don't try to use the blockchain for everything, you can use it in anything. And and I can talk more about that later. And that's really interesting. And just to press on that a little bit more, uh, baseline protocol. So what's the role of uh, the enterprise adoption of blockchain from baseline's perspective? So uh, from the baseline protocol community, which is now hundreds and hundreds of people and companies, um, more join every day. Uh, you probably heard uh, a couple of weeks ago, the Coke One North America is using uh, the baseline technique. Not only is it, are they using it, they're actually using it to baseline a fabric shared database. Uh, you'll, whenever you, whenever I talk about private blockchain, you'll hear me call it a shared database because I think it's a better term for it. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, a fabric shared database with uh, SAP and Oracle and Mongo and other databases. So uh, yeah, the, the technique is, is out of the box ready for any public blockchain because we're using techniques that allow you to um, deposit proofs of consistency onto this public blockchain so that you don't need to set up a new integration rails or an, a new, a new um, 
uh, uh, integration bus every time you have a new partner. That's really the value of using a public blockchain is you've got, you have, you don't have any more silos, but you still have compartmentalization. Only you and I may know about a particular work step in a workflow, but there might be hundreds of people that know about different steps in that workflow. And there could be thousands or millions of people that are able to integrate workflow steps one to the other in it with integrity if they're all if the um, anchoring of all of those are on the same state machine, the same mainnet. So I, I like to say mainnet capital M for the capital I internet, the job is pretty clear. It needs to be a always on tamper resistant state machine that can't lock you out, resist being controlled by any given party. And um, and then don't put any data on it because anybody's any data you put on that is going to be seen by everybody. Even if you encrypt it, if I have a really good AI, I'm gonna be able to, you know, I'm gonna be able to generate all sorts of classifiers just on your activity. So baselining is, um, the baseline standard has a lot in it that is just about making sure that even those baseline proofs that you're putting on the mainnet, don't give away your position, your activities, or your relationships to anybody. And now, so on the topic of kind of work roles and also supply chain processes, I want to take a step back and Dan, I'd love to turn to you now and just try to identify some of the, the current issues in supply chains at present, and then really breaking down what kind of roles blockchain tech plays in solving some of these issues. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, great question. Thank you, Jessica. And John, that, that was awesome, by the way. Great job. Um, now, from you know my perspective, I come from a completely different background than John. Uh, I have a supply chain background itself. So uh, I've handled tens and thousands of transactions all around the world from China and the United States and Canada and so on and so forth. And my life turned into sort of like a, a manual process of compliance uh, for supply chain, making sure that these processes all happened. Uh, but at the same time, I kind of lost uh, track of you know the, the important things like your clients and your actual products. I was just trying to get the products to the clients without really being detailed in the rest of my life. So uh, I had this conversation with Noam actually, who's you know I'm happy to be on this call as well with us. And uh, I told him that you know life life is good in a sense. You know like you know business is good. Where I'm extremely busy. Uh, what can we do? You know to make my life a little bit easier. I, I told him what I do in a day to day. And it was about oh, just over three years ago now. And we literally broke out uh, a napkin at a restaurant. Uh, I, Noam, I know you'll be embarrassed that we that you had four apple juices at that, at that sitting, if you recall. This is true, yeah. This is true. It is true. <laughs> and uh, we started drawing out what, what a supply chain is. Like, you know, when I take in a, a purchase order, uh, how that data, you know, sort of transmitted throughout the entire supply chain, right? So looking into inventory, finances, getting logistics set up with all those parties down the supply chain as well, whether it's your customs broker, your freight forwarders, or 3PLs, your shipping companies, ocean freight, so much involved in supply chain, all these disjointed sort of systems that are out there. Uh, so my, my sort of positioning at the time was to take in all this data information from all these different sources and make sure the data is transmitted to them to make sure the supply chain pu get pushed ahead. Noam, it clicked in his head. He's like, why are you doing this manually? There is definitely technology shared, you know, ways of, you know, digitalize, digitalizing what you're doing. So everyone is viewing the same documents, the same information. Um, obviously the complexities, you know, when it comes to blockchain and things being on mainnet, John pointed that out perfectly that you don't want sensitive data to be on blockchain. So our view with Morpheus network is we, we tackle a, you know, enterprise that's looking to optimize what they're doing, looking to, you know, save money, you know, saving time for their, their employees, maybe even cut employees if the technology is good enough. Right. And basically working with a protocol like baseline allows us to continue to use mainnet, which is public encrypt and allow companies to leverage blockchain at the same time without putting all their sensitive data on the mainnet itself. Uh, now our view as middleware is connecting all these different disjointed systems. Uh, now the way I described, you know, my life before and, you know, going through a supply chain doesn't even bring in all these different third parties involved. Let's say your clients, someone who's sending you data might be a completely different ERP they're using. They might be using Oracle or, or SAP and you're using JD Edwards, right? So having a middleware layer in between to connect all these data points, that's what we do. And um, you know we're finding it extremely profitable and, and useful for a ton of companies. And um, we love how we're growing. And on a daily basis, we're, we're tackling different projects. Um, I know no one will get into some projects as well, but uh, one, one that I'm extremely proud about, and uh, I know that, you know, Jessica will have a talk about this later on as well, uh, is the work we're doing with Vital Can down in Argentina. Uh, they're the largest national pet food provider in Argentina. 
Uh, we've done a complete transformation of their business processes. Uh, so much so that the, the CEO, uh, Jorge, uh, Jorge Marcos has actually stepped up, created a new technology company in order to push Morpheus across all of Argentina. And we're moving ahead with projects with the Argentinian government, uh, bringing on all his different suppliers as well. So really amazing stuff. And, um, you know, it's, it's sort of validation that at first it was, you know, selfishly it was for my own business to see how I can make this stuff go better. But now it's working for all these other companies and it, it is really fantastic. So. Wow, congratulations. And we'll touch on collaborations in just a second as well, because John, you also mentioned Coca-Cola there. So there's some really interesting things going on from all of you. And Noam, Dan painted the perfect picture there of, you know, how you were able to really visualize supply chains as being a great use case for blockchain. So I'd actually love for you, Noam, just to identify for our viewers some of the main things that really you wish everyone knew about blockchain and Ethereum. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. Thank you, Jessica. And uh, before I get into that, uh, John, again, you know, big congrats on the init core launch, uh, you know, huge achievement, huge milestone. And I know it took a lot of, you know, huge community to to come together to make that happen. Uh, so we're obviously big fans of uh, baseline. Um, you know, we view it as really a paradigm shift in the use of blockchain technology. So um, it's a really exciting development. Um, Jessica, to your question. Um, what do I think about blockchain and Ethereum? Um, with blockchain, and I've mentioned this a, a number of times, but it's worth repeating. Uh, blockchain now, I really compare it to the early, early internet. So I remember being on the internet in you know mid 1990s, and if you tried to you know purchase something online, it was a horrible experience. If you tried to watch a, a movie online. It was a terrible experience. You had to download it. Uh, you know, the audio was terrible. And, you know, just using the web was a terrible experience. And the reason why is because it was so early in that technology's life cycle. And the point here is that technology moves so fast. And if we look at e-commerce today, if we look at, you know, Netflix and what we do online today, it's we could not have envisioned that back in the early 1990s. Um, so technology moves so fast and blockchain really is so, so, so early. Um, even the, you know, evolution of baseline, the, the new baseline protocol, which kind of came out of nowhere in a sense, um, that's a completely new way to, to use blockchain. So blockchain in five, 10 years will be completely different than what we see today. And that's super exciting. Um, and then Ethereum specifically, um, with our platform, we made the decision to be blockchain agnostic. Um, one reason is simply because we can utilize, you know, the best of the best. We can use, say, a Hyperledger or a public uh, Ethereum network or something private. Um, but our main chain really is Ethereum. And one of the reasons for that is because of a maybe a belief that the largest ecosystem wins. So Ethereum, I believe, still has the largest developer community. It's a you know, very active community. And I think generally, when you look at ecosystems, the largest ecosystem, the one with most support, uh, generally wins. Um, so those are you know, my thoughts on, on blockchain and Ethereum specifically. Um, and just on that topic, John, just a quick question. Why did you choose uh, Ethereum as your main chain for baseline, if I can ask that? Well, sure. I, I think um, so. The baseline protocol works is designed to uh, to be friendly to the things that a public, a good public blockchain, one that maximizes tamper resistance um, and minimizes surveillance resistance. Right? Everybody can see it. Um, to be friendly to that, there is no such. If somebody says to you, "I can do a million transactions a second on a public blockchain," they are leaving something out. They are lying to you or they're leaving something out or the context is a little different. I remember talking to a very well-known person who I respect. I don't try to hire him twice, uh, but he was like, oh, our thing runs, you know, this many thousands of transactions a second. I said, all right, well, you hook it up to the database you're going to have to use or the, the data layer that you're going to have to use underneath it. Oh, well, then it goes down to less than 100 transactions mm -hmm. a second. And then it gets worse from there, right? So um, you're, you're in computer science, it's always about trade-offs. And the, I think the public blockchain, even as it is today, not without any ETH2, makes the appropriate trade-offs if you're using it as a consistency machine. That is, I don't know anything about what, I, what you're consistent about, 
but I can tell you for sure you're consistent about it, or whatever that is. And that is a very forgiving uh, pattern that you can use a public blockchain for without gumming it up or you know, you know, downing it with. It's when you start to think of blockchains and in particular public ones as the back end of your Twitch game or your application, mm -hmm. right? Or your crypto kitties, right? Whatever, what have you, where every read and write has to go to the blockchain. Mm -hmm. So I like what you said earlier that that you know, we have this, we're blockchain agnostic. I would say you're state machine agnostic. That is, you're gonna use the right state machine for the right job at the right time, whether that's DB2 or Oracle or Mongo or Neo4j, by the way, Neo4j, uh, shameless plug. I love those guys uh, no, and they're not paying me. Uh, I love graph databases. Um, I think graph databases are kind of interesting in this space, by the way. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, you know, any, any database, including Fabric, which to me is a good shared database. Uh, and, and then you need a mainnet to when you need those things to be verifiably consistent on a record to record basis. And you need the workflow logic to be verifiably run in a verifiably identical way. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's when you would baseline those different state machines. So yeah, you can have any number of base blockchains you want. You can have any number of databases that you want for any purpose. But at the end of the day, I think I'm not agnostic mm -hmm. about what needs to be the main net. However, I need to be honest and say, the game is not up about who gets to be the main net. I know what the main net's job ought to be. Mm -hmm. And I work for some consensus people. So I, or, you know, for, for Ethereum folks. So uh, I, I have a dog in that hunt, but I also wouldn't be here if I didn't think it was a pretty good candidate. If I saw de decisively a better candidate for the main net, I would be compelled to go with that. I just haven't seen one yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, what you mentioned about the, the scalability trilemma of blockchains, I think you're right. I think Ethereum has done a great job balancing you know, security, um, um, decentralization, and, and scalability. Um, you know, Ethereum's having some issues today, uh, but... You know, I think the roadmap with ETH2 is, is a pretty good roadmap. Yeah, and I got to say, for a young person, uh, it, well, for a bunch of young people, it, the, the stone-cold, sober way that they're approaching the evolution of the platform um, is, you know, I know old-school development teams that don't have that kind of discipline. Mm. Um, I would like it if they would not say things like, you know, it's never going to, you know, years away, and then when they do hit a date, they... They can slip it, so there's some there's some improvements to be done there, mm -hmm. but uh, you know for confidence sake. But what I am confident in is that they are very professional and sober about their technical decisions mm -hmm. and how they implement them. Mm -hmm. Now I do want to take a look at the collaborations that we've seen from the organisations that you are all representing as well. And John, I do want to start with you um, because. Even I follow you on Twitter, so we're regularly keeping up to date with the, the updates and they are coming through very strong. It seems like Baseline and other organizations have been very busy. Uh, so what have been some of the standout collaborations so far this year that have really stood out for you? Oh, my favorite one. Well, first of all, uh, kudos to uh, a little company called Provide Services. Mm. Uh, Kyle Thomas has turned out to be like the, we talk about MVP is like uh, most uh, minimally viable product. He's the MVP in terms of most valuable player for this round of our game. Uh, he and, uh, and, and also Karthik Solipurum from, uh, from Ernst & Young, some of the folks on my team, uh, Brian Chamberlain and, and Sam Stokes, who's stepped up to be the sort of the ringleader of the maintainers in terms of uh, making sure we're all pointing in the same direction. Um, so there's some really great uh, contributions. So, uh, and I know Provide works a lot with Unibright, I know, and they work a lot with Nethermind and they work a lot with uh, with you guys uh, over at Morpheus. So it's turned out that this little stack called the Provide stack has made it really easy for people to deploy and, and uh, manage a block, a baseline um, architecture or a baseline stack as you would might want to call it. So, you know, you need a, a client that has this little thing called the iBaseline RPC in it and uh, 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 Nethermind, not my company, unfortunately for me, uh, but Nethermind um, uh, was the first to incorporate, co incorporate that RPC into their client. So now you can basically baseline with any Nethermind client. Uh, I'm sure that ba Besu and, 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 uh, and folks will be uh, quickly on the heels of that. So 
and we're here, you know, every day we're hearing about somebody else being baselineable or baseline. So I want to see a, 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 an article come out that says Morpheus is, ba you know, you can, is baselined, uh, that SAP is baselined, that or uh, uh, Microsoft Dynamics is baselined. And recently, a company called LimeChain uh, built a baseline uh, demo or baselining demo between uh, Microsoft Dynamics and Google Sheets. So in the Google team, a lot of Google engineers are really, uh, we had like 120 Google engineers that just asked to have a briefing on baseline. They all showed up. It was wow. cool. And uh, it reminded me of the early days of Java back in the 90s when like the 2,500 IBMers were supporting the Java development open standard uh, before Lou Gerstner, who was the CEO at the time, told us that we were allowed to. So lots of companies, it's the engineers that are coming up and saying, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm baselining. Are you baselining? Yeah. Um, and now their companies are kind of working through their OSSC, their open source standards committees to, to make it safe and allow them to, to use, to, to contribute, uh, in an official capacity. But yeah, lots of products that need to be baseline compatible or compliant or capable. And, uh, and I love the idea that even a spreadsheet can be baselined because I'm sure Dan, Noam, you, you probably have lots of stories about how. I think the Coke story is about this a lot, uh, that 30% of their their counterparties are too small to really run an integration layer with uh, de novo, right? So they need something that's inexpensive from a capital expense uh, perspective. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're a little tiny radish grower uh, and your wholesaler says, hey, join my blockchain, well, what does that mean? You know, they don't know, right? But if you, but if you get a DocuSign that says, click here and oh if you want to baseline that which means you have a system of record that your wholesaler is going to make you be a lot happier about and maybe give you some points for uh maybe maybe give you a better deal um because they're confident now in your records click here and you know for 995 a month you have a baseline system of record just kind of like mint mint for for systems of record mm -hmm. right i mean was, that that's got to be a factor for you guys as well right Oh, well, most definitely, most definitely. And um, I, I just, just based on, you know, you mentioned uh, Kyle Thomas uh, and, and Unibright as well. Um, I just want to mention, you know, using baseline within, uh, you know, our Morpheus transactions as well, just to build on what John was saying from a supply chain perspective, it just makes complete sense, right? Um, the, the current project that we were working on with with Kyle and with uh, Stefan from uh, UBT, who I wanted to thank them both for being just, just amazing and, you know, available to, to work on this and push it ahead. Uh, it, it's a supply chain transaction for cross-border activities. So a lot of the business we do is, is crossing, you know, uh, products from Canada to the U.S., from Mexico to the U.S., and so on and so forth. Uh, and there is some sensitive data involved in crossing these shipments. Uh, and there's multiple parties involved as well that all have to be on the same page when it comes to this supply chain. Uh, so when you have, let's say, a shipment going from a, from a seller into a buyer, from a seller, let's say, in Canada, and then a buyer in the U.S., this is the specific POC, actually, with, with Stefan and Kyle that I'm describing. Uh, we have our customs broker involved. We have our shipping company involved as well. Uh, we have actually our partners with customs directors integrated into Morpheus. They're a customs broker themselves. Uh, and what happens is the sensitive data, which is the PAPS number, the clearance number, actually gets baselined and available to not only the, the customs broker, not only the shipping company, but also customs border protection as well. They'll review that sensitive, that sensitive number of a PAPS number for each individual clearance across the border. So as you can imagine, you know, within one truckload, uh, there can be, let's say, a dozen different shipments within one truckload. Each one of those shipments has to have a PAPS number. So you have all these different parties involved. It's possible that the buyer and the seller, the customs brokers, everyone could be different, but they're all accessing the exact same system with the sensitive data being on mainnet, but encrypted at the same time. It's, it's really fascinating, and it just makes perfect sense in our, in our supply chain platform as well. So. And you did a really nice job there at identifying that, and, and John yourself as well, that smaller organizations can also get on the on the mainnet and also get on board. And Noam, I, I also want to ask you when it comes to corporate, corporations that are really looking to increase profitability, where does the blockchain supply chain, where, where does the answer come with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. Um, when we when we you know approach a company for the first time and we talk about our platform, um, blockchain really is not part of that initial discussion. Um, you know we view blockchain as a technology no different than you know TCP IP or you know databases. The conversation really is around the benefits of 
uh, blockchain, like immutability and keeping records in sync. Um, and, you know, these companies, they're really interested in, you know, like any business, they're interested in ROI and, and money and where we can save them time and, uh, and time and, and money, ideally. Um, so that's, that's our co um, kind of conf con conversations with them going in. Um, but in terms of the benefits, it, it really is that, you know, any engagement we have, uh, we identify specifically those KPIs, you know, we identify um, how we're going to benefit them. And then we typically run a pilot. And after the pilot, we can identify very clearly that we've saved you this much money here, this much time. Um, part of the reason we're able to do that is because, you know, as, as uh, John mentioned, a lot of these companies are still running on, say, Excel or Google Spreadsheet. Um, there's a, a ton of, you know, communication that's still done through fax machines or WhatsApp and all these disjointed systems. So that's why we use our blockchain-based backed middleware to really connect everything. And once everything's connected, that's when you get to optimize these processes and automate a lot of the processes, which then leads to, um, you know, saving money and time. And I'd like to turn to, to Dan now and ask you for uh, some of your favorite examples of blockchain integration, because I think that the fascinating thing about speaking to all three is, of you is you're based in different parts of the world, you're working in different subsectors, all integrated in some way. Um, so I'm sure you're going to have different answers. So Dan, I'd like to hear from you first. You know, you know I, it's tough to say, you know, the blockchain integration itself, you know, like as sort of John and Noam uh, you know, sort of explained it, it's not necessarily integrating blockchain that, that gets us excited. It's a part of the whole solution, right? So um, if I was talking about, you know, specific functionality that, that we perform and I find, you know, over the top cool, that's just awesome. And then we can validate the data using blockchain and encrypt it on, you know, leveraging baseline protocol as well. Uh, I, I love, you know, honestly, a geofence trigger. So, you know, it's something that follows around a specific, you know, physical asset. And when it enters a certain zone, a radius that you can set in the platform, it triggers out the next motion. So whether that's a final payment, whether it's a simple notification, just letting people know that it's arrived, right? Uh, I find that amazing. Um, then I realized that it's actually a similar functionality to our, you know, navigation systems in the car. And when you arrive somewhere, it tells you, oh, now you've arrived destination. And then when I hit set up in the platform, I think it's the most amazing functionality ever to be able to not rely on, let's say, human interaction, a specific scan, or whatever it would be, you can actually have that geofence trigger off, you know, future events. Uh, and, and what we do with our platform as well, uh, whether it's uh, something like a, an electronic proof of delivery, a QR code scan, we actually get the latitude and longitude of the actual scanner himself, and then can build up business rules about based, based on where they are themselves, right? So let's say they're scanning it and saying, we've received the product, but the actual, you know, spot that the person's located is a hundred, you know, miles, you know, to the to the east or whatever it is. You can be like, no, you actually didn't receive the product. We're not going to release final payment because we have your latitude and longitude, and the trigger won't be set up, set set forward. I guess you could say. So, don't know if that's, you know, in a sense, the validated information, leveraging blockchain on the back end as that, you know, decentralized notarization tool that we use. That is a, a blockchain integration of it, but that geofence trigger, I'm over the top excited about that for sure. Yeah, I, I wonder if I can ask a question on that, Dan. Uh, sure. You guys are, uh, Jessica, apologies. Uh, no, please uh, I, I'm curious. Thanks. Uh, I, I'm curious about uh, your, your EDI has been around for 40, 50 years. Um, and you guys are pretty heavily involved in EDI. And it's, EDI has always been, you know, electronic data interchange, has always been uh, about uh, usually bilateral uh, arrangements, right? You know, and it's a document tagging format how mm -hmm. do you how do you see base how do you see your work with edi going forward when it comes to like multi-party edi and that sort of thing you know what we're, we're lucky enough to have these you know partners that we have like customs direct uh, dynamic customs brokers all these guys that are in a sense experts in their industry when it comes to customs and clearing shipments across the border right they deal with all That's the smart. sort of integrations we do right so my view as as a sort of importer exporter in my background is about the you know getting the products where they have to go and then using those disjointed systems in order for that to happen itself. Um, I, I know that you know through the baseline uh, community, there's some amazing projects going on right now around EDI itself. Um, what what we do specifically is more about connecting the data that's being used by these companies. So it goes back a little bit to um, uh, I, I'd say that that 
argument you guys had about you know which blockchain to use for which system argument is not the right word but um we let our in a sense our clients dictate based on their business structure based on what they're doing we're not going to tell them you know throw that all away we're going to institute this new system so we got to play with what they're playing with right so if they're you know leveraging let's say for example uh, a certain erp or edi uh, or an iot device using a, a specific telematics system, you know provider we don't say to them no, no no our partner is geotab they have an amazing device rip out your no we use the systems that are in play pull that data together and make the data actionable so we can push all this stuff ahead so when you're talking specifically about baseline leveraging all those different systems coming in from different places themselves being able to integrate all that data together i, I think it's a it's a perfect use you know, use case for that with all these different stakeholders involved. So I hope that answered your question as well. And, yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. And I would love to turn to you now, uh, John, and just ask your opinion on what we've seen over the past seven days when it comes to the news on consensus and also JP Morgan. Um, from what I've kind of read, it seems like it's quite positive news for the industry. Oh, I think so. Uh, and then, uh, and so I'm going to do that thing where people say, thanks for that question and then answer a totally different question. Um, <laughs> no, I'm kidding a little bit. Um, obviously I, I, I'm not uh, directly involved in, in all of those uh, uh, big, big announcements have been pretty focused on the baseline work. Um, I, I'd say my team is the build the thing that is going to be the thing that those guys. So I think you said a, a pioneer, um, Pioneering. I'm really not a pioneer. I'm a scout. Um, once the once the pioneers show up, I'll hang out in the saloon for a while, uh, you know, and, and stay at the hotel on the dusty main street. But then, you know, the settlers will show up with the courthouses and the jails, and I'll, I'm out of there by then. Um, so I'm a scout, and my team is is scouting. You know, so the baseline protocol is is moving rapidly towards a place where the pioneers and the settlers can safely settle on that ground. Uh, but that's constantly kind of where my team lives. So I, I like to say I'm, I always live about 18 months in the future. So the consensus team, Consensus Inc., is definitely in the <clears throat> here and now. This is what they are building. They, they, they're selling real stuff right now. And uh, the announcement uh, with Quorum was, you know, yet, yet another plank on that, on that road. Uh, I hope that answers the question without answering it. I just don't, I don't want to speak out of turn and there's a lot of other people speaking on that particular subject. No. Uh, but I, I would like to say, uh, I'd like to answer uh, what Dan was talking about uh, when it comes to specific uses, if you don't mind. Um, there's two that are quite interesting. And in, in a way, uh, Noam was talking about the early internet and I still think of blockchain. Strictly speaking, if you consider that blockchain technology rapidly becomes very conservative in its development because a lot of it is in, involved in like maintaining the value of these tokens and coins. That makes you really conservative pretty quickly. So technology acceleration is a factor moving things faster, but then the blockchain factor of coin maintenance slows it back down. So I almost think that the internet, the time frame of the internet itself might be more or less one-to-one -one consistent with the time frame of blockchain development. And if that's true, and 1969 was the first packet move from one place to another, that would put us in 19, what, 89 or 91? Or yeah, 19, no, 1979 or 1981 or something, right? We're maybe in 1982. We're pre-CompuServe here, right? And, and so I think that would be the my analogy there. But even with that, there was a lot you could do with the internet before CompuServe and AOL. And I think in this case, some real basic things like using baseline, you can uh, take a bunch of purchase orders and you know, revenue recognition, boring subject, billion dollar problem. Um, you're, uh, the, the amount of time you have to take to r recognize revenue under GAAP, under generally accepted accounting principles are, is, is fairly long because it's very easy in traditional disconnected state machines like a, like an ERP system to get a bunch of in invoices or a, a bunch of purchase orders and have two or more of them calculate against the same discount rate because they weren't aware of the other ones in, inching up the, the level of overall product orders, right? So if I've got an, a product a purchase order, so I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm boring everybody already. I mean, this is boring stuff. In fact, we've been saying boring is the oh, next time, right? So... Uh, uh, you know, I've got a hundred units that I'm going to order from you. 
the next purchase order needs to calculate from 101 up and then et cetera. And that sequencing is really hard to get at unless you have a common frame of reference playing traffic cop on those events. And you need, in order to have a common frame of reference, you have to have a state machine that's always on and can do that. And that's where the main net and baselining comes in. So that's a really basic thing. So it's almost like in the mid nineties, everybody needed a web page. Didn't matter what vertical you were in. You just wanted a web page. And then you needed a spinning logo on that web page, <laughs> I recall. And then after, and then more seriously, you needed a catalog. And then you needed to be able to sell stuff on that directly on that catalog and take a payment from that, you know. And now you're into e-commerce. So it's not a vertical story. It's a horizontal story. Same thing now. It's, I don't know. It doesn't matter who you are. You could be a bottler. You could be a shipper. You could be a freight forwarder. You could be a customs uh, certified agent, but you're going to want to baseline your systems of record with other systems of record so that you can do B2B business process automation. That's the big story. It's not about blockchain anymore. It's, it's it, BPM used to be about business process management inside a single company. Yeah. Today, because of stuff like this, you can start doing really good fine grained business process management across any number of separate, legally separate entities. I think that's the big story. And the, the final one is invoices. So, um, you want to tokenize, so it's not about token. Forget about tokenize. Don't even say. I didn't say that word. Um, let's say. Let's say this. I am a, a supplier, and I need to get paid sooner. I need money coming in to cover the expense of making the next lot of stuff for the next company. And I just shipped a bunch of stuff, and I've got an invoice saying that they owe me money someday, right? So ninety days from now, I'm going to get that money. Sometimes, right? I want to factor that invoice. I want to get cash sooner than that. So somebody will step up and give me 80% of that cash in cash. And then when they collect the rest, they'll give me maybe up to 94%, 96% of it. That's called an invoice factory. And today that's done with a very small number of very high value invoices, very slowly on paper. It sucks. But there are companies like, uh, like Centrifuge uh, and companies like Consensus uh, uh, with Codify that can tokenize those invoices and sell them to large markets of people that they, and then and, and can collateralize it. I think Centrifuge is working with MakerDAO. So it can be a invoices, short-term debt, basically, short-term corporate debt as a form of collateral for MakerDAO. It's a cool idea. Amazing. And what is it, and what's the most boring part of that? In that whole process, the person that's going to put up the money for that 80% that goes to the supplier needs to know that they're going to get to collect that money from the person that bought it. And that today means going and calling up that, that dude and making sure that, that re their records are the same as the records that were reported by the supplier. If that invoice was baselined, yeah. you might still call them just to double check. But you know that, that that buyer can't say, I didn't get the memo, I don't have the same record. It's a baselined record. And therefore, they can take that one step out of the process. Boring, big deal, non-repudiation. No, it was fantastic. And there's a final question that I would love to address to all of you. And John, you said it yourself there that you're actually always kind of 18 months in the future when it comes to looking ahead. So I'd love to ask all three of you, and we can start with, uh, with Dan, what kind of things you have in the horizon? What are you looking ahead to in, in your internal roadmap? Yeah, most definitely, you know, it's, um... For myself and, and for Gnome, for the whole company in a sense, it's every day is exciting because we're talking about these different projects, different implementations. Uh, I, honestly, I, I don't know when this is going to be aired, but we just had an amazing conversation two days ago um, with FCL, which is one of our clients. Uh, they're run, right now running our um, food certification uh, document handling system. Uh, so basically all their food suppliers uh, are keeping their certificates updated, uh, leveraging Morpheus Network, this whole automated system where before it was this really old system of emails and attachments and them having to manually check expiry dates and so on and so forth. And now we've built this whole automated system for them as well. So it's, it's fantastic. And the conversation we had is they're talking now they're different business units within the company itself. Uh, and we're onboarding all their vendors right now as well. Uh, that's the second implementation with FCL that we're working on. Uh, the third implementation as well, they've already uh, localized that to traceability. 
Uh, so they want to make sure, um, I, I, you know, we can talk about the, uh, John, I don't know if you know the specifics of that Kona project, but I believe that the Kona, the Coca-Cola Kona project is, is, is regarding traceability as well. Um, and, and that works really hand in hand with what we're doing with FCL and other food products. Uh, they have most of their suppliers actually come from the U.S. Uh, they do over a million cross-border shipments into Canada uh, and supplier to over 2,000 retail locations in Canada itself. So, uh, and regulations in Canada are quite quite strict, right? So it's it's important for them to be up to date, and we have that with certificates, onboarding the vendors and moving ahead. So I'm just excited about growing, uh, onboarding new clients. Um, I you know listen, uh, I can get into you know fine detail with our work in Argentina as well. Uh, started work with the you know the government of Argentina, which is just fantastic, onboarding producers and. You know, I can go on and on. So, Jessica, I'm just excited. <laughs> it sounds very exciting, the key word there. Uh, and, and John, what about you? What is kind of in the roadmap looking ahead? Is there anything in particular you're focusing on? Yeah, now that the version 0.1 is out, and of course that's going to now set, set in motion uh, the, the evolution uh, from 1 to 2 and et cetera, and uh, get all the way, all the way up. Um, and we have a, a really uh, a cool group of people that are starting to step up to the standards development around that now that we have a code base that we can interrogate and say, yeah, we like this, we don't like that. We can start to have those interesting and fruitful arguments about, well, the standard should be this way because it's really about standards. It, you know, everybody can do it differently, but they need to have the same interfaces or you know, your SAP system won't be able to baseline with your Oracle app system or your JD Edwards system. So you, that, that's really important. That's why it's a standards-based approach and not just... Um, uh, open source, straight up open source. Um, the things that were that are on my mind now are the things that that are you know, every technology, every advance has things that it's not good at, that that create real opportunity for commercial um, things, especially in standards based stuff. You got to look for the stuff it's not good at, and then that's where you can sell something to make it to make that problem go be less of a problem. So, for example, in in track and trace. Which we've been doing with you know fabric and other kinds of databases shared databases the, sh the the i think that the loom is off the rose of companies going oh that's a great idea let me put all my my secret data about my supply chain uh, activities onto a shared database with others i mean when when that also meant that you got to stand on stage in front of thirty thousand people in vegas with jenny rometty from ibm you know that then you okay all right i'm gonna do it but now it's getting boring and you're like, wait a minute, why do I want to put all my internal records on this thing that every, that Walmart's running? I'm not sure I do. And so you're starting to see this slow down, um, I think, uh, although I'm sure lots of people would dispute me on that. Uh, wink. Uh, but, <laughs> but here's the thing. Um, uh, baselining doesn't have that problem because you get to leave your data in your own database and it doesn't go away, right? All it, all it says is, this one record in my database is verifiably identical to this one record in your database, right? It's not, but I'm not punching a hole in your firewall or your or yours, you and mine. I'm not primarying my system or your system or some new, like MQ or some other system that we had to stand up for a million bucks. Now um, we're able to use the mainnet to do that job, but you don't have the data in one location. The one nice thing about having a shared database is that all the data is there, and you can do really quick. Um, uh, epidemiological, uh, uh, you know, analysis. So if there's a bad radish in a lot that gets, you know, you, you want to know where all the bad radishes are, you can do that very quickly. I, I remember uh, the head of Walmart saying, oh, uh, we can do, we can uh, track a bad lot of uh, product in under two seconds. I said, well, if you did it on Mongo, you could have done it in under two milliseconds, but hey, it's okay. <laughs> um, but the, the, so the point is, um, how do you get, how do you maintain compartmentalization without, without and, and still get to those bad radishes? And the answer is synthetic data is one way to do it. Graph databases, as, that's why I'm kind of excited about Neo4j. So I mean, if you could do traversals over data, you know, this synthetic data, which is effectively what our, the Merkle tree that you get when you baseline stuff kind of looks like. And there are companies like Diveplane, which is a cool company here in Raleigh, that, um, that are really good at synthetic data. So I'm really kind of interested in you won't be able to know where the radishes are, but you'll be able to ask which systems you can say, Hey, system X, uh, company a, you, I need to, I, I need to now get access to your data. I'm the CDC because something bad's happening. And I know it's where it's, it's in. So where to look is something that you could get to without actually having the data in a big, in a big, um, 
in a big honey pot. Sure. Well, John, Dan, Noam, you've given our viewers, I'm sure, so much value in, in all the information you've given them today. Thank you all so much for your time today. I've really appreciated and also really enjoyed this conversation. It's, a, it's been amazing to catch up and I'm sure we'll do it again in the future. Thank you all so much for your time today. Thank you, Jessica. Thank, Thank you, Jessica. Thank Great you. questions. Thank you for, you know, organizing this and uh, really was enjoyable. So it was, I'm sorry it's over. It was an absolute oh. pleasure. Thank you so much. And I would love to do it again. I'm sure for our viewers watching, if you have any questions for perhaps an episode two in a few months time, drop them in the comment box below. Uh, it was an absolute pleasure. And uh, thank you all so much today. Well, we really hope you enjoyed this exclusive interview and learned a lot along the way. That's all that we have time for, but do drop a comment in the comment box below if you have any questions. And Dan will actually be joining us for AIBC LATAM on the 24th of September. There is still time to register free of charge to hear some more insights on blockchain on supply chain. See you soon. <laughs>